Do God's expressions of what we should do imply what we actually could do? For example, God says we should be perfect, but does that imply we could be perfect? We should obey God's law, but all of us fall short. Therefore, should does not always mean could. But was that the purpose of the law? To make us perfect? Was it given as a means for us to earn or merit our own righteousness? No, the law was given as a tutor or a schoolmaster to help lost people realize their lost condition and need for a savior. As Romans 3.20 states, quote, By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. As Paul said in Romans 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. Likewise, in Galatians 3.24, he says, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. So, the law was never given for us to fulfill it. It was given to point us to Christ, the only one who could fulfill the demands of the law. Has the law failed to accomplish the purpose for which God sent it? Some theologians seem to suggest it has failed due to something they call total inability. Total inability is the belief that the fall in the garden caused all people to be born in a condition whereby they are morally incapable to respond positively to God's own appeals to be reconciled from that fall. So according to this view, the law, apart from some inner irresistible working of grace, sometimes referred to as regeneration, is insufficient to lead the lost to realize their need for help so as to accept God's appeal and provision for reconciliation. This analogy might help. Suppose you had a horrible gambling addiction, and as a result, accrued a debt so large that it was literally impossible for you to repay. Would your inability to pay off this debt excuse you from paying it? Of course not. You should pay off this debt, regardless of whether or not you could pay off this debt. This is an example of where inability does not remove responsibility and thus should, does not mean that one necessarily could. Likewise, the scriptures teach us that we should obey the law of God perfectly, Matthew 5.48. But it also teaches us that no one could, Romans 3.23. Our moral inability to fulfill the law's demands does not remove our moral responsibility to the law. We have a sin debt that we cannot pay, Yet scripture seems to teach that we are held accountable for that debt nonetheless. But suppose your wealthy and benevolent father offered to pay your gambling debt for you if you would simply confess your addiction and go to rehab. Clearly, this is something you should do. But could you do it? Of course you could. Your inability to pay off the debt in no way hinders you from accepting the benevolent offer of your father's provision. Likewise, with regard to the law, your benevolent and gracious father offers to pay your sin debt if you confess your sin addiction and trust in him. Clearly, this is something you should do, but could you? Of course you could. Your inability to pay off your sin debt in no way hinders you from accepting the benevolent offer of your father's gracious provision. But suppose someone tried to convince you that one's inability to pay off their debt equaled their inability to accept help when it was offered. Would you believe them? I ask because that is what our Calvinistic friends are attempting to get the church to believe with regard to salvation. Some Calvinists teach, quote, what the scriptures say we ought to do does not necessarily imply what we can do, 
The Ten Commandments, likewise, speak of what we ought to do, but they do not imply that we have the moral ability to carry them out. The law of God was given so that we would be stripped of having any hope from ourselves. Even faith itself is a divine command that we cannot fulfill without the application of God's regenerative grace by the Holy Spirit, end quote, from monergism.com. Now, are you following the Calvinistic argument? Here it is put very simply. Number one, God tells man they should keep all the commandments. Two, man cannot keep all the commandments. Three, God also tells man they should believe and repent for breaking commandments. Four, therefore, man also cannot believe and repent for breaking commandments. If the fallacy in this argument is not obvious to you, please allow me to explain in this way. Back when my children were younger, we did a family activity that our church had suggested. When I stood at the top of the stairs and I told my children, you can't touch the railing or the stairs or the wall, but you have to get to the top. Ready, go. They looked at each other with bewilderment and at their mother for help, and they didn't know what to do. After a lot of time of struggle and striving to figure out a way to get to the top, finally, in exasperation, the oldest looked at me and said, Dad, this is impossible. We can't do this. Can you help us? I raised my eyebrows as if to give them a clue, maybe they're on the right track. He quickly caught on and said, Dad, can you carry us? I said, I will carry you if you ask. And each one of them asked, and I carried them to the top of the stairs. And then we sat as a family and talked about salvation. We talked about the fact that you can't get to heaven on your own, but that Christ offers to carry us if we will just trust in Him. But suppose that my children's inability to get to the top of the stairs also meant they were incapable of accepting my offer of help. Imagine how this story would have played out if it was impossible for my children not only to get to the top of the stairs, but equally impossible for them to recognize that inability and accept help when it was offered. This illustrates the mistake of Calvinism. Let's go back to their fallacy above as it relates to my story. One, Dad tells his kids they should get to the top of the stairs. Two, kids cannot complete this task as requested. Three, Dad also tells the kids they should ask for help. Four, therefore the kids cannot ask for help. Do you see the problem now? The whole purpose of presenting my kids with that dilemma was to help them to discover their need for help. I am their tutor, their schoolmaster, pointing them to their need just like the law. So to suggest that they cannot realize their need and accept help on the basis that they cannot get to the top of the stairs completely undermines the very purpose of giving them that dilemma. The purpose of the Father in both instances is to get others to trust Him. The law was not sent for the purpose of getting mankind into heaven, just as the purpose of the activity was not to get the kids to the top of the staircase. The purpose was to help them to see that they have a need and that they cannot do it on their own. Calvinists have wrongly concluded that because mankind is unable to attain righteousness through the law, that they must also be equally unable to attain righteousness through faith. They have concluded that because mankind is incapable, morally speaking, of making it to the top of the stairs, then they must equally be incapable of recognizing their inability and accepting help. Paul taught in Romans 9, 30-32, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. It seems Calvinists would have us believe that because pursuit by works fails in attaining righteousness, that a pursuit by faith would not even be possible. This is simply never taught in Scripture. When Calvinists are pressed on the obvious implication that should implies could, they appeal to the demands of the law, which is like appealing to my demands for the children to get to the top of the stairs without touching anything. 
I didn't make that demand with the expectation of my children actually doing it. After all, it is impossible. I made the demand to help them realize they could not do it without my help. So too, God did not send the law with the expectation that we could actually fulfill its demands. That is not the purpose of the law. Remember, according to Scripture, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Romans 3, 20. The law is a tutor who points us to our need for Christ. The law was never sent for the purpose of being fulfilled by mankind, just as the stair climbing activity was never intended to be completed by my children. It was a tutoring lesson to teach my children that they must rely on someone else, a useless activity indeed, if they are somehow incapable of coming to that realization or admitting their need for help. If my kids are as completely incapable of understanding their need for help in getting to the top of the stairs as they are in getting to the top of the stairs without help, then why would I even bother with the activity in the first place? Likewise, if mankind is as completely incapable of trusting in the one who fulfilled the law as they are in fulfilling the law themselves, then what is the point in sending an insufficient tutor to teach them a lesson they cannot learn? The argument that should implies could remains virtually unanswered by the Calvinist who appeals to the law as their example. That is, unless they can demonstrate that it actually was God's intention for us to fulfill the law's demands in order to attain righteousness. After all, to conclude that man cannot fulfill the purpose of the law's demands begs the question because it presumes man cannot fulfill the purpose of the law by believing in the one who fulfilled its demands. Our inability to be perfect does not prove our inability to confess our imperfections and put our trust in the perfect one. Basic common sense tells us that if one ought to do something, he can do it. This is especially true if one is punished for his failure to do that which is expected. In 2 Thessalonians 2.10, Paul says of the unrighteous, quote, they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth in order to be saved. And in John 12.48, Jesus said, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. Scripture never once says that we will perish because of Adam's sin. But over and over again, it says that we will each be held accountable for our response to the clear revelation of God. According to Paul, all men stand, quote, without excuse. Yet Calvinistic doctrine seems to give mankind the best excuse imaginable. On that final day, if the judge were to ask, why did you remain in unbelief? The reprobate of the Calvinistic worldview could legitimately say, quote, I was born hated and rejected by my God, who sealed me in unbelief from the time I was born until the time I died due to the sin of another. Can you think of any better excuse than that? I cannot. Please like, share, and subscribe to help us spread the news of God's love and provision for all people. Remember to visit our website at Soteriology101.com. To support us, click the support link to become a monthly donor, or click the classroom link to learn more about Trinity Seminary, where you can get a higher theological education.